Uh, first up, we have Eric. Eric is the studio game animation lead at BBI. Uh, he's worked at many places, including Pixar Canada, Relic, uh, many other places that he'll tell you about, um, Sony Imageworks, and he's going to be talking about how BBI uh, took the animation for Minecraft, which is very iconic in a very specific way, and turned it into a very, very different kind of game in Minecraft Legends. So yeah, we'll just get started. Uh, thank you for coming. Cool. Well, thank you for coming to my Minecraft Legends talk, uh, building an animation style true to Minecraft. Uh, my name is Eric Luda, uh, and, and yeah, I'm the principal animator at Blackbird Interactive. Uh, if a little bit about me, uh, I've been animating professionally over 16 years now uh, in film and games, uh, both. And I was the lead animator on most of Minecraft Legends development. And there's just uh, some of the projects I've worked on. So if you're not familiar with BBI, we're an independent uh, development studio here in Vancouver. Uh, I think we're well over 200 employees at this point, so we're one of the largest uh, independent studios in North America. Our founder, Rob Cunningham, he's one of the original creators of the Homeworld franchise. And we've really been trying to build our reputation on uh, in-depth strategy games, and most of our games have the signature BBI sci-fi aesthetic to them. Uh, except Minecraft Legends, obviously. And so you might recognize some of our past games like uh, Deserts of Carrick, uh, Hard Space Shipbreaker, and we're also working on Homeworld 3 and a new roguelike called Earthless. But I'm here today to talk to you about Minecraft Legends and the challenges we faced when taking a well-known IP and adapting it into a new game. And I'm going to be talking about that from an animation perspective, but it's my hope that uh, even if you're not an animator, uh, you're going to get an understanding with, of some of the obstacles you might face if you're working with an IP. And I'll try to give you a framework and a process you can follow so you can identify what the core essence of an IP is, and then uh, when you can break the rules and bend them a little bit uh, without sacrificing what makes it special. So if you're not familiar with uh, Legends, it's uh, an action strategy game that we uh, developed in conjunction with Mojang, the uh, original creators of Minecraft. And uh, in this game, you're basically brought to a version of the overworld uh, that could be before uh, the original game. You know, there's no way to know. It might be a multiverse thing. You never really know with Minecraft. And it's a gentle, peaceful land. There's no war or anything like that until the, the piglins invade. And so you're the hero, you're brought there to inspire the inhabitants and command them in these uh, battles to victory. And so five years ago, uh, I joined BBI to work on this project and I was super excited to work on something uh, as megalithic as Minecraft. You know, there's over 140 million active players, uh, over 600 million copies sold since 2011. So. You know, it felt really cool to be part of uh, something that every gamer has at least heard of. And then you have the blocks. They're this universal icon. It's pretty much like a, a, a core element of popular culture in many ways, the, the pixel-perfect blocks. So my first thought is, how are we going to do this? How are we going to create appealing animation uh, within the constraints of this very well-known uh, iconic style? So just to give you an outline of what we're going to cover today, uh, first is understanding the IP. Um, that's the approaches we took to understanding what made Minecraft unique. Then building on the bedrock, that's the process of deciding what we could add or change without breaking that essence. And finally, the approach I take to animating the characters to both serve the gameplay uh, and enhance the narrative. And along the way, I'm going to share some creative principles. These are just things that I've learned uh, over the course of my career that really help uh, kind of get me focused on goals, try different things, don't make assumptions, stuff like that. So hopefully some of that will be helpful. OK, so part one, understanding the IP. So at the highest level, we have our core problem. How do you adapt an IP like Minecraft without sacrificing uh, what makes it iconic? So basically, you have to figure out what you can change, 
what you can't, and how do you know what those things are. So as I started to dig into this problem, the core thing in my mind that I was wrestling with is this really needs to feel like Minecraft. It just can't look like Minecraft. The movement also has to still feel like it. So Legends needs to walk this line between have, being authentic to the original game, but still have its own unique identity. And the animation challenges, they paralleled the art challenges. So you could say, if you want to look authentic to Minecraft, use the Minecraft textures. But then we run the risk of it just kind of looking like a mod. Likewise, if you push it too far, it starts to become something different. And so you can alienate the fans if you, you change it too much. So we had to find that, that perfect balance. The art team, though, they had a pretty strong starting point. Uh, despite Minecraft looking very simple, it's actually uh, pretty complex. There's this huge uh, art style Bible with all the, um, the rules, and it's it can get pretty complex uh, to make sure things are exactly right. I was pretty surprised when I first saw this, but yeah, they take it very seriously, uh, adhering to the aesthetic there. And so mastering that took time, even for the accomplished artists we have at BBI. But the problem was, when it came to animation, there really wasn't anything to go on. We had basically one decision that we had made with Mojang, and that's what we were going to have an exaggerated animation style. So how we were going to get from this minimal and procedurally generated movement to that exaggerated style, uh, it was uh, pretty obvious we we're going to have to really dig deep and uh, try, some, try a lot of different things here. So one clear characteristic of Minecraft is that the character's arms and legs don't bend. So my first thought as an animator is like, how are we going to do this? How can I animate characters if I can't bend their arms and legs? And so the only existing spinoff at that time, uh, Minecraft Story Mode, had actually kind of explored this for us. So they had chosen to bend the arms and legs. And there's kind of a visual tension. I find when you have everything straight, but then suddenly something's bending. And in hindsight, like after talking to Mojang about this, they also felt it was kind of a misstep. So Legends was supposed to be a direct descendant to the original game, so it was clear uh, we're going to have to stick with that, don't bend the arms and legs, and it really felt right to kind of maintain that. So yeah, keep coming back to the original intuition. It needs to feel like Minecraft. And so Mojang's guidelines, they, had, they talk about loving the chunk of the block and just like embracing how straight and upright everything is. So that was kind of the clear path forward. We we're going to have to figure out a way to do this within those constraints. And so that brings me to my first creative principle. Does it really need this? So as an animator, initially it seems crazy. I'm going to have to animate all these characters, and the team's going to have to animate them without being able to do something we do with every other character we've ever animated. And whatever you're doing, there's always elements that appear to be indispensable, as if the thing you're trying to do, it's impossible without doing it. And sometimes this is actually true, but more than you realize, you can actually discard that stuff. And by doing that, it forces you to look at the problem from a different way, when you can't rely on something you've always done. So it's worthwhile to scrutinize anything that seems sacred, test if it really is, be fearless, remove it, and see if there's a way. And even if you end up keeping it, it'll kind of give you a different perspective on the problem and uh, different ways to solve it. So usually when you see these talks, you hear the problem clearly outlined, and then it seems like they just figured it out and went and did it, and it all worked great. But I knew all this stuff, like, yeah, I really need to figure it out, but at the same time, I just couldn't resist like jumping in and you know, making mistakes as well. So this was one of my first animation attempts uh, at a run of a character. And you know, it's fine. It works. It's a run. But something was off. It, it, it just doesn't feel like Minecraft. Like, it works fine in gameplay. You can tell the character's running, but you know, it was just, it was just bothering me. And when you look at this animation, you can see there's a lot of sway side to side, uh, back and forth. Uh, there's asymmetry in the pose, so like the, the sword hand is further back uh, than the, the front arm. 
And just this is kind of typical stuff we always do in animation. This is like a very obvious first take at it, but it didn't quite work. So it was clear we we're going to have to kind of dig in and see what makes Minecraft's movement tick. Now, you might know this, but uh, the animation in the original game, it's all procedural. So it's all hard coded. There's no animators uh, setting keyframes or doing any animation work, uh, at least in the, the original game. So walks are quite literally, uh, I've seen them, they're mathematical sign functions that just oscillate the cubes back and forth to create the run. Uh, turning, stepping, ever, all of that is governed by code. So there wasn't, because of that, there aren't these human decisions that you can look at an animation style and say, oh, they emphasize this, oh, they went with that. Nevertheless, we had to still define this kind of programmatic movement uh, in animation terms uh, th that would let us have a starting point so we could figure out, okay, what does this movement feel like and where can we take it from there? And so as we did uh, look at all the animations that did exist in the original game, there's one clear thing that stood out and it's what I call movement along a single plane. So this is the animation you will exponentially see the most when playing Minecraft, the mining animation. And so if you take a look at this, if you think about if you actually had to do this action in real life, swing the ax, you would actually bring it out and around. If you think about the path that my wrist is making, there's kind of a circular path to it. But if you look at what happens in Minecraft, it's a very, it's a straight line. It's very direct. It's almost as if there was a window right here and this, uh, or a, a board or something flat and the movement is constrained along that. Likewise, if you look at the, the vanilla walking animation, it has this kind of U pattern to the movement. But again, it, it's almost like a wax on, wax off. If there was like a window in front of you, there's no movement forward or back. It's just kind of locked into this uh, single plane here. And then finally, if you, it's pretty obvious when you look at the walk animation in third person, very toy soldier-like. The arms are just kind of moving here. Normally when we walk, you know, your arms are kind of swinging back and forth in front of your body a little bit. Same with the legs. You might step one foot in front of the other, but no, here everything is on the same, same plane. So went back with this newfound discovery and this started to feel better. This started to feel more like Minecraft. You know, taking out some of the things I would normally do in animation and just confine it there. And this started to feel like we were going down the right path. And so you, if you think about it, uh, these are where the final animations ended up for uh, Hero Locomotion in the game. And this constrained movement palette, it actually makes a lot of sense when you think about Minecraft being on a grid it makes sense that your movement would also be very uh, constrained there. So this kind of revelation, it really established our foundation to the animation. So that works really well for uh, the movement, but what about character posing? Now the only full body animation in the original game was the walk, so I focused on that and trying to think about what does that walk look like? What does it remind me of? I brought to mind like the pedestrian crosswalk signs. You know, it's very instantly recognized. It's very simple. It's very clear. And so that seemed like the useful philosophy for posing Minecraft characters. Don't make it too complex. Approach it as if you were making something for a sign or a button. Make sure that silhouette is uh, very obvious. So we continued exploring posing the character while limiting to that uh, single plane movement and thinking about poses as icons. And so when you're doing creative exploration and you've already set up like these limitations, it's not just like sky's the limit, which you can do if you have like a, your own IP or something, but when it comes to working on an original IP, it's very important to not uh, get too carried away because you just make your life uh, much more difficult later when you try to reconcile those things. So in animation, a lot of the things that we cultivate, uh, asymmetry, squash and stretch, these things are kind of directly at odds uh, with Minecraft's aesthetic style. So is anyone here an animator by chance? 
Okay, a couple of you, cool. So you probably recognize this instantly. This is uh, from a book called The Illusion of Life. Every animator reads it. It's by two of the uh, Disney Night Old Men who created the animation techniques uh, we still use today. And you can see what they're talking about here. If you make a character's pose symmetrical, doing the same thing on each side, it feels flat and not very dynamic. So try not to do that. And you can see how they broke up the example with uh, Mickey Mouse here, uh, showing a better way to approach it. But if you look at a Minecraft character, it's as symmetrical as you get. Another excerpt shows, like, don't, don't do a straight line. Never have something straight up. You know, try to add a dynamic bend or a curve in there as, as much as you can. But again, Minecraft, straight lines, straight, standing as straight as you possibly can. But there were other principles that Minecraft did embrace. Uh, things like line of action, that's basically uh, the direction of the movement. And so if we go back to that mining animation, even though it's a straight line, even though it doesn't have like that nice arc, it's still very direct. So thinking about movement in terms of direct straight lines, we could still do that. And again, going back to the posing, uh, iconic posing, that's all about silhouette. So you know, we emphasized the principles that Minecraft did, and then just tried to uh, put the ones that didn't uh, kind of on the back burner there. And so the point I'm trying to make here is that the IP, what the IP does should take precedence over uh, whatever your discipline is, uh, the conventions there. So in terms of animation, I told you like my first attempt, that was stuff we usually do, but it didn't feel right. And you have to kind of go against uh, things that you might typically do or always do if they also don't jive uh, with uh, what the IP is doing. So that brings to the next creative principle, define your limitations at the start. So what, by doing that at the beginning, you just keep the IP uh, on the forefront of your process. Rather than coming up some, with something that you end up liking and thinking is really cool, but then you, try to, you might have to like shoehorn or retrofit it in. And I have a hunch that's the reason like, uh, a lot of us, if we played like sequels or something and they, they don't feel like the original anymore, that might be a reason why. It's trying to make something that isn't inherent to the IP work, even though it, you know, it doesn't quite gel there. So the goal is to minimize drift from the IP as much as you can. And when you're working on someone else's property, the question should not be, is this good? But is this right? Now, because the characters are made of blocks, once you start moving them around, it's really easy to start disconnecting the arms and legs from the body. So these things like gaps, hinges, they make them feel more like kind of this ghostly assemblage of parts rather than a cohesive physical body. So I created a style guide. You, hear, you can see some of the things that are easy to do, common problems, ways to fix them. Also, the way we designed the rigs also made it easier for the animators to avoid uh, some of this stuff. So Minecraft characters are simple, but crafting poses that use that simplicity and leverage it to look like really clear and elegant, that's pretty difficult to do. So we worked hard to give the character poses appealing despite not having some of those traditional principles uh, readily at our disposal. So here's one good example. You can see just some subtle differences in the poses really help. If you look at uh, the first example, all the arms and legs are at a slightly different angle, and you start creating all these different perspectives, and it makes the shape get very, very complex very quickly. Also, breaking up like the line, that straight line between the, the torso and the head. So you can see the second example feels more cohesive, it feels simpler, clearer, and it's still the same idea. So one of the most effective tools I like to use when uh, trying to understand like the ins and outs of something is abstraction. And I just, by that I just mean you're stripping away as much detail as possible and testing if your, the essence of your concept still rings true. So in the context of an IP, you could think about this as prototyping or temporarily gray boxing, whatever that means for your particular discipline. So, Outside of animation, there's lots of creative ways to do this. Uh, designers, they often go to board game versions or paper designs. That's a great way to abstract something. 
you know, artists, you can try to reduce everything to lines only or a color palette. Writers can reduce the plot to an outline. Whatever it means for you, uh, you try to just make the simplest version possible. So there's two good advantages to this. Uh, it lets you experiment and iterate with minimal overhead uh, and resources. And it's also a really good litmus test because if the concept feels right in the abstract form, then it's most certainly going to feel right once you start putting all the cool stuff back in. So in animation, this is often uh, replacing the characters with cubes or very simple forms. Uh, if you're an animator, you might remind you of the flower sack exercises where you have this very simple flower sack and you try to create emotionally specific poses with them. Uh, but here I'm also talking about abstracting the timing and the feel, just using cubes to get that right. Uh, because without the appendages, without faces, it, you really got to hone in on the essence of how something moves. But as a twist, I'm going to illustrate my point with a different game. Because the unique circumstance of Minecraft being the IP is already abstract. You don't get much more abstract than cube characters already. So it kind of came in the box. So I didn't really need to do this sort of thing with these characters, just because they're basically blocks already. So I'm going to go to another project that I worked on, uh, Dawn of War 3, which is a RTS game, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, and anyone who knows RTS, there can be dozens, uh, maybe even hundreds of units on the screen at a time. So it's very important that the player is able to clearly discern units from each other. And giving each uh, faction its own unique movement style so uh, things are easier to separate uh, when you're playing the game. So basically, I used only cubes and distilled each faction down to one axis of rotation that they were going to emphasize, so X, Y, or Z, and also the style of the up and down movement when they're running. So if you look at the Space Marines, you, you think of these guys, they're these big super soldiers, they have this very heavy, massive armor, these huge shoulders that that felt like the right thing to emphasize. So when they're running, you really want to feel that Y axis. That's the twist in the body. That was the most important thing. And then giving their up and down a very chunky, where it spends most of the time on the ground rather than up in the air, that makes them feel heavy. And you contrast that with the Eldar. You know, they're very graceful. Uh, they want it to be like these elegant, almost ninja-like uh, characters. So they have minimal up and down, you know, because they want them to feel very light. A slight lean forward, and it makes them feel more like they're kind of skating or gliding around the battlefield. And then finally, the orcs, you know, they're this chaotic horde. They're just uh, always keen to charge into battle. So emphasizing the Z rotation, which is you could think of as waddle this way, uh, it gives them a bit slight edge of humor there, as well as also just making them feel really enthusiastic and also making their up and down um, much more bouncy. So when I take the colors away, hopefully it's clear that there's some very distinct differences in the core movement of these, uh, these three factions. And so while this example is specific to animation, again, you can use abstraction uh, with anything. Uh, so game mechanics, level design, control feel, just strip it down to its basic form and find what's most essential. So the insights you should gain from abstraction is making sure your core foundation works. And it'll set some creative boundaries for you uh, that'll help when you get into, get into the weeds later for more specific and detailed decisions. And it just helps you determine what's critical. So through all this stuff, we basically zoned in on our animation pillars. Blocks don't visibly bend, emphasize the single plane movement whenever possible, and clear iconic style posing. So now that we had our animation pillars, we needed some logic to help us deal with uh, the exceptions you're going to run into. So I like to call these workflow pillars. So it's important to note that uncompromising adherence to your uh, IP pillars is not really necessary. Uh, I have the 80-20 rule. So I think this is a pretty reasonable dieting strategy, to be honest. Like, you know, you'll get most of the work if you, you know, 
follow your diet and do your exercise 80% of the time, you'll get slightly better results, yeah, if you do better, but you're gonna get the lion's share of it by hitting that 80%. And a similar approach uh, works in animation. So in other words, you don't have to restrict to the single plane movement all the time. If you follow it most of the time, then it's still gonna feel like you're, you're basically following the rule. This really let us uh, have some opportunities for some of those things that initially seemed like, oh, maybe we can't do like some of the squash and stretch and the archy stuff, but we could. We just had to be very sparing with it. Another example here is the creepers. Uh, if you look at the little creeper idols, you can probably see their heads pulsing a little bit. It has a very slight jello feel to it. You might think, well, this is Minecraft. You're, didn't you just say you want to follow the IP? And the reason we felt safe doing that is because there was a precedent in the original game. So if you look at the creeper in Minecraft, right before it blows up, scales up. So it's a bit like being a lawyer in some ways. Like, you kind of look for these, okay, it said that here, you can do that, that means we can use this here. But I think it, it puts you on pretty solid ground. So just kind of showing you where we use some of that. Again, it's not something that's obvious in the pose. There's still stretch, there's still squash. It's just hidden in the movement. So you feel it rather than see it. So we have the 80-20 rule, and then the other workflow pillar uh, I call bias towards the minimum. So just human nature for most of us, it's a tendency to overcomplicate things, you know, even when you have your the rules well-defined. So one good example was uh, in Legends, there's a lot of stair-step uh, terrain for the mountains and things. And I spent an awful lot of time trying to come up with good ways to uh, make the characters feel more realistic when climbing up these uh, constant steps. And there might be like 100, 200 steps in a row. So it, it could get pretty crazy. And I kept running into problems, lots of edge cases. It was really difficult to make it work uh, consistently. And so those technical issues eventually reminded me of those guiding questions. Does it really need this? And is this right for Minecraft? So if you, I went back thinking about the original game, you know, the characters just glide up the steps in the original game. There's no stepping, there's no specific animation. So it became clear that, you know, maybe we can just basically do that. And then you start to draw a parallel back to the original game. So we ended up for the mounts, there's just a simple tilt when you go up and down uh, blocks. And it just sells the faintest idea of gravity and momentum, but not overcomplicating it. Likewise with the mobs, they do have a climb animation, but they only play it uh, when they're on their own and wandering in the world. If they come up to a step, they have like a little hop that they'll do. Otherwise, uh, if they're engaged by the player, they just glide over the steps uh, like the original game. So that felt like the right balance uh, of enhancement without deviating too much from the original game. So it brings us to another creative principle, what would your IP do? So if a feature wasn't present in the previous versions of the game, you know, it's good to reflect on, are you actually making something better? Or are you just doing something different? Uh, there's an opportunity for cohesion with the original uh, games if uh, you preserve something from the original, even if you can change it. So in our case, yeah, the climbing stuff, it wasn't really adding anything. It was creating all these problems and making the movement more complex. So it made sense to just kind of keep it the way it was. All right, so we got, now we have our workflow pillars, the 80-20 rule, bias towards the minimum. With all that stuff established, now we could turn to what the fun stuff. What can we add on top of it to, to make Legends unique and make it our own? So if you look at the original game, uh, the movement in Minecraft has this kind of effortless gliding quality to it, and it works fine uh, in that context. But uh, unlike the original Minecraft, Legends has a very distinct narrative. It has a specific story. It's telling the player is the hero of the overworld. Uh, the piglins are very fierce threats. So that smooth gliding is not gonna help us convey uh, that tension and drama of the story. So we needed a distinct contrast of light and heavy characters. And to do that, the animation had to have a, a strong sense of weight. So 
So what gave confidence that this was okay was that we could add weight without undermining any of those uh, established IP pillars. Uh, characters can still move on a grid, they can still have restricted movement and posing, because weight is all about the timing. And that timing was the one thing Minecraft didn't seem to have an opinion about, it's all kind of the same. So that felt like we had the freedom to expand upon it. So adding the weight at allows for some stylistic exaggeration, but we didn't want to take it too far and start going into cartoon land with it. Uh, you want to keep, we wanted to keep gravity and materials relatively uh, realistic, uh, behaving the way they do here uh, in, our, in real life. And that helps players connect with the, the game. So there's a little bit of stylation without getting too cartoony. You can see here in this uh, animation of the portal guard attack. So it helps it feel heavy, you know, as the spike ball comes down before he sets it, there's like settle in his body. And then when he fires, uh, fires it, hangs in the air a little bit longer than it actually would in real life and drops a little bit faster, but just enough to give it a little bit of punch, a little bit of spice without starting to feel like a completely uh, foreign material. It was also crucial uh, to have the characters feel weighty because uh, both BBI and Mojang, we didn't want the game to feel like you were watching it play on a tabletop as if they were miniatures. So uh, if they did, then we'd make everything feel very small and light, but uh, weight helps uh, work against that feeling. And so here, here's another example. Uh, if it's not clear what's going on here, the Magma boss, he has this attack where he smashes his arm into the ground and pumps lava underground, and then it comes up in these geysers all around the player. So just by selling how much effort it takes him to really stick it in there, you know, how much time he spends up in the air ready to put it down, and then slams it down, and then it, he did it so hard that he has to kind of really pull on it to get it out, just kind of selling this sense of gravity and uh, heavy materials. So we made a lot of new characters uh, for the Minecraft universe. Uh, here's a couple of them, the cobblestone and plank golems. And what's unique about them is they're kind of named after what they're made of. So it felt pretty important to reflect the materials properties and how they move. And adding weight, uh, let us adopt this idea called truth to materials. So as an animator at Pixar Canada, uh, my work revolved around the Toy Story and Cars franchises, and Truth to Materials is basically the tenet of those, uh, those two things. This concept has had different interpretations uh, in art and architecture throughout history, but basically the way I would describe it in the context of gameplay animation was that characters should not move contrary to the properties of what they're made of. So whether they're a small or large person, a plane, an animal, a toaster, doesn't matter. What they're made of and their anatomy dictates what they can do and what they can't do. So there are a couple examples here. You can see uh, like here in this shot of Guido. The only things that are actually moving on him noticeably are stuff that makes mechanical sense, his little forklifts. If it has a mechanical joint, he can move it. If there's squash, it's on the tires because uh, they have air and they're made of rubber, so it makes sense that those would squish. But really, you don't see his body, metal body, bending around because metal typically doesn't easily bend. Likewise, uh, the mini buzz character, uh, an action figure, it's kind of that same idea of single plane movement. Like if a action figure is manufactured, it's on, only its arm can go one way, then that's the only way you should be able to move the arm to have it feel like that's what it actually is. So by embracing these things rather than being like, well, I wanted to do a certain action uh, just because, you actually infuse authenticity into the characters. But when it comes to games, uh, this idea of truth and materials often runs right uh, up against uh, what design needs. And so for me, this is one of the great joys of gameplay animation, finding a way to reconcile both of these things uh, so both the designers get what they want for the game and it's clear uh, what's going on and we still manage to satisfy these our animation uh, principles that we've uh, been talking about. So here's an example with the co cobblestone golem. So this character, it's made of dense heavy stone and it 
also needs to be able to move on a dime and respond to player commands. So those three things aren't really compatible. But if you look at his walk here, it makes sense when it's just walking around. His legs, they're very small, so that it takes a lot of effort for him to move that big chunk of stone around. But if he just started suddenly running really fast, it wouldn't feel right, because we all know from living here on Earth that heavy things can't instantly take off. It takes time to build momentum and build up speed. So looking at his anatomy, what he's made of, when he needs to move fast, his arms are actually much stronger than his legs. So adopting more of a gorilla type locomotion to get him to move quickly, that makes a lot of sense. So truth to materials, it can be a limitation, but it can also help you find some uh, interesting ways to make the characters move that uh, you wouldn't think of otherwise if you're just like, well, I'll just make it run no matter how fast it needs to go. So this reconciliation, that's really the heart of, of it. You're always balancing what the characters are trying to do with what their bodies will allow them to do. And it also applies to the animals and creatures. There's tons of those in Legends. So we referenced real animal footage, uh, just as if this was a realistic VFX creature show. You know, the fact that the animals are made out of blocks it doesn't change its anatomy. It doesn't change its behavior as a species. It's just changing the level of detail you see. So I just wanted to show a few examples that uh, some of the great work the animation team did, like the war boar. Uh, he referenced uh, how wild pigs really root. It just gives them this like this feeling of being uh, relatable, something we've seen uh, in in the real world. And like looking at the insects the beetle, how the wings move, how the, the locomotion of six legs works. And most people's favorite, purple tiger. Even though it's made of blocks, it's still a cat, so it's going to do cat things. Cool, so we focused on those two main areas up, up to this point. We have understanding the IP, which gives us the animation style. And then building on the bedrock, that's kind of the, the approach we could take to adding new things to the animation. And these two things uh, create the visual style, but that's not enough. So we have the what, we have the how, now we need the why. And to create, make the characters compelling and relatable, we kind of got to dive into their uh, individual minds and create some depth here. So this is what we call animating from the inside out. So the guiding principle of character design and development uh, on the game was dangerous cute. And what that means is characters should absolutely look cute, but they should never act cute. Because they don't see themselves that way. Uh, the overworld, their whole existence is thrust into war. That wouldn't be fun for us, so it shouldn't be fun for them. I kind of liken this to uh, when you watch little kids play like Star Wars or something, and as external observers, it's like adorable to watch them like, you know, you're playing with the lightsabers or whatever. But for the kids, it's very serious. In their minds, they're like locked into this uh, narrative, this fantasy of what's going on. So like this picture I found on the internet, it's, it's just so adorable because this kid is so serious. He's definitely a Jedi in his mind. But, you know, we look at it and it's, it's really cute. So that's kind of the essence we were going for. There's also the factor of motivation. So when kids are sincere, then they're just going to naturally be endearing and cute. But if they're intentionally acting cute to kind of manipulate you, you see right through it, and it makes it much less endearing. So if we animate the characters based on what would look cute, it's going to make them feel inauthentic and cloying. So the cute design should hopefully attract, and then the goal is that the portrayal of authentic behaviors makes the characters themselves engaging. So what animating from the inside out means, uh, you develop a thorough understanding of your character before you animate them. And ideally, actually, even before they're designed, uh, honestly, like as the game designers, it's great to have a sense of this as well, to understand what you want uh, out of the gameplay and how the the character should interact with the player. So to do this, you need a backstory for all of them. Uh, 
things like their personality, their fears, life events. This is all going to affect how they move and how they perform the actions you need them to in the game. So understanding this uh, motivation, even for the minions, the, the smallest little enemy character, it's going to help you uh, really have a, a unique idea of where these characters are coming from. Why are these minions following the boss? Are they, do they have no other choice in their life? Or are they totally drinking the Kool-Aid? Like, understanding that for yourself is, will help inform uh, how these characters should behave. So you want to give each of them a unique and consistent personality and psychology. So this is, an excerpt, like, this is an exercise I like to do with every character I animate, like a mind map, just figuring out what it was like uh, to be them. You basically, it has to be unique, and you need to imagine their perspective. So thinking about, well, Piglet and Grunter, how are they born? How do they grow up? What is, do they go to a school in the Piglin civilization? What's their school like? What sort of things happen to them? And it seems kind of silly, but really, if you have an idea of who this character is, it makes it uh, so much easier to come up with something unique uh, for them uh, in terms of their uh, acting choices and their movement. So yeah, understanding their outlook and goals. You're never asking what would be cool or what would be funny. You just ask, what would this character do in this situation? Uh, and coolness and funny stuff is going to just evolve naturally from that. So it brings us to define your characters first. By creating those backstories, you understand who the character is, and it simplifies your process of making choices for uh, what sort of uh, design elements they should do, what sort of gameplay mechanics they should employ, uh, what types of animation uh, they should portray. So you think about something like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. He's very uh, depressed all the time. He moves very slow. If Eeyore, for no reason, suddenly starts jumping around, you're, it's just confusing. There has to be a good reason for a, a character to move differently. And that's really what we're establishing here, that baseline. So if a game has a significant story component or a writer, this backstory might already exist. That's great. But if it's vague or non-existent, you kind of have to do it yourself. Uh, the main thing is that it, it exists uh, somehow. So for Legends, while there was an extensive story for the main characters and events, there wasn't really much on the mobs and the smaller piglins. So we had to study the existing story, formulate these backstories ourselves. And this is something we did uh, in dailies with the animators. It was actually the best part of the whole project, getting together a few times a week, talking about who these characters were, coming up with ideas of, for how they would move, how they would act. And it really made the collaboration uh, feel rewarding and fun. So just one example from this. It's one of my favorites, the Piglin Runt. So the typical design is a little guy with a big weapon, you know, something we've seen a million times. But how could we push that a little further? How could we, could we make this feel more sincere, more authentic than just like another trope? So we decided it really reflects the mentality of the Piglin leadership. These guys aren't valuable enough to give them proper equipment. Whatever's in the warehouse, they're expendable. Just give it to them and we don't care. So in the animation set, we portray them as coping with this as best they can. So, you know, they struggle to move their weapon around. You know, they have to drag it or try to balance it. And then in their idols, they're always tired. You know, they take a break, they set it down. You know, it's, it's stuff that is just in the periphery here. It's just a little detail, but hopefully you do enough of this and the players start to notice this and it just makes the world feel much more rich rather than every character just kind of idling, breathing, and looking around and having nothing uh, unique about it. So again, idols are a great place to do this. You keep these details in the periphery. They, they'll never overshadow the main action that you need them to do. Locomotion is a great way uh, to communicate like, a character's personality as well. Uh, one I liked working on was the portal guard in the bottom right there. You know, making his heavy uh, spike ball almost like an impediment to his moving. It's so heavy, it actually holds him back a little bit, but still uh, making him feel determined, like he's coming to get you, like the, the T-1000 and Terminator 2, even with its legs gone, it's crawling for you. So just trying to convey like these personalities within the locomotion. 
And then whenever possible in the gameplay actions, so here's a cheer, the cheer animation, whenever you defeat a piglin base, all the mobs cheer around you, celebrating. So again, going back to truth and materials, we looked at each character. How would this character cheer? Uh, the mossy golems, the little green guys, you know, they have these water jets, so it seemed cool to make the jets the thing that propels them up. Just, again, looking at their anatomy, thinking about who they are, their personality, and having that inform the way they do their action. And finally, the UI. So these aren't uh, specific different characters uh, in the game. They are just skins, but it still felt like an opportunity to add some unique uh, character moments when you think all of us decide what we want to wear, and that says something about how we want to present ourselves uh, to everyone else. It says something about uh, each of us. So it, it makes sense here that these different outfits would have the characters behave slightly different way, just to give uh, the feeling that it's not just the skin, that there are thoughts going on behind each of them. So to recap everything we talked about, understanding the IP, we talked about finding common threads, uh, and these give you anchors uh, in the IP, testing those threads uh, with abstraction. And by doing that, if it works, then you get your IP pillars. And then you come up with your workflow pillars to keep from feeling overly constrained. Then building on the bedrock, these are the things you make outside of those IP pillars. These are the new things you're bringing to the, to the IP or to the game. So it should be based on precedent or things the IP doesn't specifically address. Uh, and then truth to materials will help you create a consistent characters and connection to their world. And finally, thinking inside out. Remember that this movement and visual style is only half. You want to have background stories for all your characters and base your choices on them. And just to blast through the creative principles again, uh, does it really need this? Always test your assumptions. Even the thing you do every single time, try taking it out. See, see what you get. It helps you discover new approaches and insights. To find your limitations at the start, that'll give you those guardrails to keep from drifting too far away from the IP. Always asking yourself, what would the IP do? Are you doing something better, or are you just doing something differently? And it'll help you create a through line to the previous games. And then define your characters first. Knowing who they are before you animate them or design them really helps you dive into their motivations and personalities, and it'll help everyone find nuance and interesting choices. And that's it. So it's my hope that some of these ideas are helpful if you are working on an IP or you ever find yourself uh, doing so. And yeah, thanks. Are you, you got time for one question or two? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, questions from the audience. Here we got Noah here first. You touched on it uh, very briefly, and thank you, first of all, for the presentation. Um, so you touched on briefly, how do you balance uh, animation with uh, gameplay? For example, uh, the villain boss with the big uh, weapon, it seems to me that would be something that you would see it rising in the air, and then you might avoid it because you kind of know where it's going to land. Um, how do you balance animations like this? And just briefly, um, I, I know in 2D, like sprite animations, when a character presses a button to attack, it's like an instant. You try to do that first frame. How do you do that in, in 3D? And are there any challenges? Yeah, that's, that is always the challenge, honestly, with gameplay animation, uh, making it feel responsive enough. There's a number of tricks you can do uh, that you, you kind of learn uh, as you experiment. Uh, a, a few of them that I've always found really helpful is uh, Mario is a great example of this uh, because you can actually rely on the player knowing what they're trying to do. So normally when you have to jump in the air, you, know, you have to get lower first and then push yourself up. But because the player is, knows they're pressing the button to jump, if you look at Mario and most jump animations, they actually don't anticipate. They just go and nobody cares because it doesn't feel bad because you wanted to jump. The anticipation kind of happens in your mind. So there's ways of thinking like that. Uh, but yeah, it's always a challenge to get that responsiveness. It's a lot of collaboration with design. Uh, it's really important to know your designers and always be talking to them. Uh, because you might find like 
maybe design has assumptions about how long something should take, but then you put an animation in there and you find like, oh, actually we could do this faster, or it feels bad, we actually need to slow it down. So you really have to just kind of collaborate and iterate together to come up with the best balance of that kind of stuff. Uh, another great example, uh, I remember noticing this in World of Warcraft, and I just, whoever thought of this was like a genius, like when you jump in World of Warcraft, it's the same thing where there's no anticipation, but the camera actually dips down and goes up. So you get the best of both worlds. It feels like there's an anticipation, but then there isn't. So um, when I first noticed that, I'm like, that's a genius. <laughs> but yeah, that's, it's basically comes like everything in game dev, even though it sounds like a cheesy answer, it comes down to collaboration and iteration in the end. Uh, thank you very, very much for the presentation. It's just a small commentary about one of the principles of define the limitations from the start. Uh, I know that music for video games, the reason why they, in the 80s era, why they couldn't use a chord, like three sounds stacked together in a harmony, because if they use that, the composer used that figure in the game, it could kill uh, almost 75% of the chip tune to just produce one sound, and they need to use another figure, because they knew that some that other limitation from the start, and they use it arpeggios instead of a chord, they use it. And mm -hmm. that creates this style in games, and many games, like Two Wolves and other games, use the arpeggio. And it came because it came because of a limitation that the musicians knew when they were making music for games. They established this limitation that they couldn't obviously use the chords, but they could do something equivalent. So and it creates an entire new style of music for video games. So it's a small commentary that you can use in, for example, you can use in other, or it's created the principle of uh, defining the limitations of your hardware from the start or from the IP in the case. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Yeah, that, that is an awesome example for sure. Uh, one of my favorite things is like, you know, initially, sometimes limitations seem like a, a downer, and you're like, oh, how am I going to do this? And it's easy to kind of get depressed about it and feel like you don't have many options. But, you know, you, if you embrace that, like you said, they, the whole style of that era of game music is based upon embracing those limitations and coming up with something new. So, yeah, seeing it as an opportunity, for sure, is, is kind of the key. But, yeah, thanks for that example. That, that's great. Yeah, thank you very much, Eric. Yeah, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.